I uh, want to welcome you to Macklin Baptist Church again on this Sunday morning. This is our uh, Sunday School Bible Study time, and we have classes going on all around our church this morning, and uh, we're trying to return to normal and give people a chance to have face-to-face -face contact. Uh, but for those of you that are not able to do that, and then also for those of you that uh, will be joining us later on this week and the weeks to come, uh, we thank you for joining in with us. Um, we uh, have had a, a really good response to the Bible studies that God has allowed me to, to share with you. And I, I say it over and over how blessed I am because this is a dream come true for me to be able to share with you some of the truths that God shared with me over 31 years of teaching and, uh, and then especially the years since I've retired. Um, I've, I've had such a good response from so many of you. Um, we've had, Margaret has been sharing it with her friends and Cheryl was watching last week. Uh, uh, we were eating supper and one of my former students from Pebblebrook, Vicki, came up to me and shared with me how much she'd enjoyed the Bible study. And uh, I'm just blessed by the opportunity to share these things with you. And I'm, uh, we're gonna continue this morning studying about the evidence for creation. And specifically today, we're gonna talk about what about the dinosaurs? Uh, that's a, uh, that's a, a, a big deal in, uh, in science today. And God has shared some things with me that I think uh, just in recent months, really, uh, some of this evidence, and I wanted to share that with you. Let's start with a word of prayer this morning. Father, I, I thank you so much for letting us uh, gather together today. Father, I thank you for Macklin. I thank you for our staff. I thank you for our Pastor Mike and Eddie and Carlos. Father, I thank you for guiding them with your Holy Spirit. And I pray that this morning as we look at your word and as we look at the evidence that proves that it's absolutely true, Holy Spirit, I ask you to call to my memory those scriptures and passages and examples that you've given me so that we can understand that your word is true. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This morning, I, I want to continue again, and, and I want to preface all the things that I'm going to say with this scripture of 1 Thessalonians 5.21. God tells us, test all things and hold fast to what is good. I encourage you to test me on the things that I share with you. You should be doing that in all of your Bible study, but I ask you in particular to listen to the things I say, and if you have a question about them, you look it up and you check it out. Because if you can't test me and it show that it's the truth, I need to change what I'm doing. So the question is, where did the dinosaurs come in? Uh, we looked last week at the fact uh, about the missing links we talked about, there are no missing links. You see, one of the crucial parts of evolution is that each animal evolved into another one and eventually apes evolved into humans. Well, there's no evidence of that. It just doesn't exist. As you and I were taught in school, and many of them are still teaching it in school today, that there are missing links. You know, I thought about this example, Margaret and I were talking this past week. When you look at the automobiles that we have today, wow, with all the whistles and bells and all of the things that they do, if you go back and look at the very first automobiles, the little Model A, and you compare that to what we've got today, can you imagine going from that to where we are today with no in-between models? If, if, if none of them ever existed, and all of a sudden you, you looked at the beginning and you looked at this one and you said, no, 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 no. Well, it's the same way with evolution. There should be uh, animals that are 90% ape, 10% human, and then it could continue down until it's 90% human and 10% ape. But you know what you find in the record? We talked about it last week. 100% ape, nothing, 100% human. There's no in between. It doesn't exist. Why? Because God said in his word it didn't exist. 
Okay? And so the question is, well, what about the dinosaurs? Well, first of all, the word dinosaur is not a word that, that uh, was used in the beginning. The word dragon was the word that was used in the beginning. The word dinosaur didn't come in until the 1800s when, when a man coined that. So, so the question is, where are the dragons? Well, according to the scriptures, according to the scriptures, God said that he created the animals, and then it said that he created humans on days five and six. And so they were all created together. So we ought to find evidence that they were living together. Now, to jump ahead, we know that when the ark came and when the flood occurred, God said that he brought two of every kind of animal aboard the ark, okay? Two of every kind. Not two of every, every variation, but two of every kind. And so that we know that when the ark came off, Noah didn't lose any of them, <laughs> okay? Whatever went on came off. And so when Noah, at the end of the flood, two of every kind of animal. So there were two dinosaurs, now, those dinosaurs developed into the, the types of dinosaurs that, that uh, we see today because they had all of the DNA in there that, that existed. So, so the deal is that, that uh, why, why were the dinosaurs or dragons not mentioned after the flood? Well, the explanation, if you think about it, is pretty simple. <laughs> you, you realize what we talked about before the flood? You realize there's no mention of dragons before the flood, okay? There were, there were no mentions. Why? Because there was no difference. The dragons, dinosaurs, were just like all of the other animals. Do, do you remember what we talked about the other day? We talked about the guinea pig. Remember, remember what the guinea pig looked like? The guinea pig was 1,545 pounds, okay? Pretty big. What about the beaver? You remember? about the, the beaver. The beaver was eight foot tall and weighed over 500 pounds. And so th this is just the beaver and the guinea pig. All of the other animals were gigantic too because the, the, the climate was different. Remember, God said he made it very good. So we talked about that. So the dinosaurs were there with all of the other animals, but as the people looked around, there was no difference. You've got all these huge animals. Well, the dinosaurs were huge too. Well, they were no different, okay? So there was no reason to mention them. It was only after the flood came, when the climate changed, that some of the animals grew to be larger and some that, like the beaver and the guinea pig. The little guinea pig today is about like this size for the most part and you have it for supper. Well, no, no, not unless you live in Peru. Uh, if you live in Peru, you have it for supper. <laughs> if you live in Powder Springs, then you go and pet it, and you, you know, let it play all over you with a guinea pig. But, but with these animals then, then they begin to stand out. And after the flood then, they begin to talk about them. But wait a minute, after the flood, there were humans that were living there. So was there, was there any evidence that they lived uh, at the same time? Well, we're going to look at some evidence today that's right before you, but you've probably never looked at and you've never noticed it. Now, before I get started on this, let me have a disclaimer. And this is what the disclaimer is. <clears throat> Everything we talk about today, if you look it up, the first thing you're going to read is, well, that's not true. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's really just a myth. Well, you know what? If you read one of these items you could say it's a myth. But as Margaret and I were doing some research on this, we found over 30 or 40 items that relate to the same thing. Now, if it's one thing, you can explain it away and say, well, you're really crazy, you missed the boat on it. But if you've got 30 or 40 instances where this has been mentioned, you can't ignore it. Right. You can't ignore it. Now, <laughs> If you were to go to the United States Geological Survey, the USGS.com or .org, whatever, whatever it is that you want to find, this is what you would find at that website. <clears throat> the question that I Googled was, is, did humans and dinosaurs live at the same time? Okay? And you'll see on the screen here, it says, no. Well, I underlined it in my notes. It says, no, 
did humans and dinosaurs live at the same time? No. After the dinosaurs died out, nearly 65 million years passed before people appeared on the earth. However, small mammals, including little shrew-sized primates, were alive at the time of the dinosaurs. Many scientists who study dinosaurs, vertebrate paleontologists, now think that birds are directly descendants of one line of carnivorous dinosaurs. And some consider that they, in fact, represent modern living dinosaurs. So some of our brilliant scientists today are telling us that birds developed from the dinosaurs and that the birds are really descendants of dinosaurs. Wow. Look at the last sentence. This theory remains under discussion and shows that there is still much we don't know about dinosaurs. Well, yes, I would agree with the last sentence that they wrote, <laughs> but not the rest of it, okay? So the question is, who do you trust, okay? Who, who do you trust? You make those decisions every day in your life. Who do you trust? Well, there are some people who tell you the truth, and they never lie to you, and you believe them. And even if they tell you something you don't understand, you still believe it. There are other people that it seems like everything they tell you just isn't true. And so even if they tell you something that seems absolutely positively true, you still say, I'm going to check that out. I'm not sure that that's really true. So, so the question is, who do we trust? Can you trust God's word? Amen. Has he ever lied to us? Has there ever been one thing in God's word that's ever been proven wrong? No, no, he has never lied to us in his word. God's word is 100% true, and you can take that to the bank. Now, as I said before, the term dinosaur wasn't developed until 1841 by Sir Richard Owen. And, the, you know, we may not be aware, but the first recorded fossils weren't found until the 1800s, okay? And so, uh, so they were there all of that time. Now, the question is, what was the largest dinosaur that ever lived? Well, it's the Patagot Patagotitan Maorum. <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's one that was actually found in, in Argentina near Patagonia on a farm that was the Mayo family farm, and that's where we get the name from. Um, I was thinking about if I ever found a fossil around here, you know, it would be the Powder Springy and Macmillanorum, you know, <laughs> and they would name it after me. But they named it after this family in Argentina that found it. And what we do know about it is that over a period of years, they, they found all of the parts of it, and it's actually in a museum in, in the U.S. today. And, and so the deal is that it was 120 feet long, and it weighed 70 tons. Now, it, it says that... Uh, it was uh, about the size of a Boeing 737, and you can see that on the picture there, about the size of a Boeing 737. That's the size of this dinosaur. Now, we're not talking about somebody drawing a picture like we talked about last week where they drew a picture of the missing link from a tooth, and it turned out the tooth was fake. <laughs> okay, that's not this. They found this fossil. They know there was an animal that was that size, the size of a 737, okay? Now, it also tells us that in Genesis 1.30, that when God made those animals in the beginning, what do we know about them? What did they eat? Plants. Well, one of the things we know about this animal from the teeth and all about it is that it was an herbivore. That doesn't surprise us. Do you see? God told us he made animals that size, and he told us they ate plants. And so the ones that they're finding today were herbivores. And so it's God's word is trustworthy. Now, the next question that comes up is, does the Bible say anything about dinosaurs? Well, remember the word was dragon. And the Bible mentions six different types of unusual animals. Some of these you've heard of, and, and some of you, you've read but you, it just didn't sink in that you were reading about it. But uh, the first one was a dragon. It's mentioned 21 times in Psalm 44, 19. The fiery flying serpent is mentioned in Isaiah 14, 29. The fiery serpent is mentioned in, in Numbers 21, 6. The cockatrice is mentioned in Isaiah 14, 28 through 29. 
Leviathan is mentioned 40 times in Job 41 is one place, and Behemoth is mentioned one time in Job 40:15. Now, so there are six different types of animals that are mentioned in the scriptures that are unusual. Well, we're going to focus on two of them today for the sake of time. One of them is Behemoth. Now, Behemoth is the most famous one, and when did Behemoth occur? After the flood. You see, Behemoth is recorded in, in, uh, in Job uh, 40, verse 15, and, and after that. And we know that from history, Job was written around the year 2000 B.C. So we're talking about 2000 B.C. Job was there because in the book of Job, in chapter 40, this is Job talking and he says, this is what I saw. I went down to the river Jordan, and this is what I saw. And he says, I saw, I saw this animal. And it says, look now at the behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now, his strength is in his hips, and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze. His ribs like bars of iron. Now, we, we know then that the behemoth, we want to look at the characteristics of a behemoth, what he said. He's made along with you. So what we know is that this animal was made at the same time that man was made. And that's exactly what Genesis 1 tells us. It tells us that in the beginning, God made the animals, and then God made humans. He's made right along with you. Well, that's totally contrary to what science teaches today. Science says the animals were there, and then they were gone, the, the dinosaurs were, and then humans came. But that's not what God told us. God told us that he made them together, and you would find evidence of them living together. Okay, This is a passage that we look at so often, and quite often we forget. It tells us the dinosaurs were living after the ark. And, and then it says it eats grass like an ox. Well, most of the dinosaurs were herbivores. That's exactly, remember the one we just looked at, the Patagontitan? You know, he, he ate it. Most of the other animals were ate plants also. Remember we talked about how, why they had to be plant eaters, because before the flood, the plants were so large, remember the 40-foot asparagus stalks, those things? And so these animals had plenty of plants to eat in order to survive. And then we see that it, 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 the strength was in its loins, in its hip, so we know that, that it had massive, massive thighs here. The power was in its stomach muscles. It had a big belly. And many people have said that maybe this was an elephant or, or a hippo. And then we, we see that it was a tail like a cedar, okay? Tail like a cedar. Many of the translations that you, have, that you read will say that it was a hippo or an elephant. Well, when it had the tail like a cedar, the cedar tree was the most powerful tree that existed, the sturdiest one. We're, we're told over and over in the scriptures about the cedars of Lebanon. They were very famous. And you look at this, this picture. Uh, look at the tail of the dinosaur. Look at the tail of the elephant. Look at the tail of a hippo. Does it look like the tail of a massive cedar tree for the elephant and the hippo? I don't think so. The only one that it fits is a dinosaur. So what we know is that Job was describing a dinosaur. It was in the Jordan River. We know that, that many of the larger dinosaurs would have had trouble moving around. It would have made it easier for him to move around in the water, so he would have gone down to the Jordan River, and, and he would have survived there. He was under the lotus plants looking for shade and cool, coolness during the daytime. And then the second one is the Levi Leviathan. The Leviathan is mentioned in Job 41, 1 through 34. And we're not going to put all of that up on the screen right now, but I want to, I, I want to uh, call out just a couple of things to you. We assume that Leviathan was a sea animal. You see the picture here of it being in the water. And the reason is it says, can you pull Leviathan in with a hook? Well, you're not, you don't go fishing out in the woods. <laughs> you, know, you go fishing near the water, so it, it should be near the water. Verse 14 of that says, who can open its jaws? Pretty large mouth. And then it says, one scale is so close to the other that no air can pass between it. It had scales on it. 
Then verse 18 says, it had flaming torches shoot from its mouth. Verse 20 said it had smoke billowing from its nostrils. Just as an aside for some homework, if you'd like to take time to look this up, look up the bombardier beetle, okay? Google the bombardier beetle and look it up. It lives all over the world on all the continents. It's a little beetle that God created for a defense mechanism. When somebody threatens it, this little beetle turns and it has two chambers in it and it mixes those two things together, a portion of it. And when those two things come together, it, there's an explosion and it shoots it out the tail and it shoots smoke and fluid at the, at the temperature of 220 degrees. And it just scorches the people that, that get hit with it. The bombardier beetle. Well, the bombardier beetle lives today and you can look it up and it's one of the miracles of God's creation. So why would it be so strange to find other animals that breathed fire out or smoke. <laughs> you see, we, we see animals today that can do that. So why is it not possible that these animals that we looked at in the past, where they talk about fiery dragons and fire coming out and smoke coming out, <laughs> it's, it's, why could they do it with a beetle, but not with one of those animals? We've often thought that maybe they were misinterpreting or mythological. No, it happened, it was true, there, there's the proof. And then it says the strength resides in its neck, and you can see the huge necks of these. And it says he makes the depths seethe like a cauldron. Well, if you're going to have the depths seething like a cauldron, you've got to be in deep in the water. And so I was reminded when I read this, uh, my mother was a fisherman, and she took me on the fishing banks with her when I was a little boy. And I remember she would walk around the lake, and she'd look out there at the water, and she'd see that water stirring up, and she'd say, oh, they're on the bed today. And she'd put that hook out there, and before you know it, she was pulling in an eight-pound bass out of that because those big bass were just swirling under there. Well, the Scripture tells us that, he see, that the depth seethed with, like a cauldron with him. And then it says uh, that it was not a whale and not an alligator, okay? So we, we know that the scripture over and over talks about Leviathan. Now, is there any other written evidence out there that talks about dinosaurs living with humans? I'm going to share some with you today, <laughs> and I say to you again, these are all very reputable people. Like the first one we're going to talk about is Herodotus. When you hear these names, these are people that if you are talking to somebody and you mention Herodotus, okay, people are going to say, oh yes, very well respected. <coughs> Herodotus, Herodotus is referred to as the father of history. He is the first recorded historian that we have, and he was from Greece. Cicero, who is another famous person in history, he's the one that called him the father of history because uh, he lived about 400, 500 BC, and he wrote about observations about, about things he saw and, and, and the events that took place in history. He was the first one to write all these things down, detailed explanations. And so people have no question about Herodotus. They'll say, oh yeah, yeah, man, Herodotus is good. Listen to this quote from one of his writings. He said, There is a place in Arabia situated very near the city of Buto to which I went, went, on hearing of some winged serpents there. And when I arrived there, I saw bones and spines of serpents in such quantities as it would be impossible to describe. He said, The form of the serpent is like that of a water snake, but he has wings without feathers and is like as possible to the wings of a bat. So he's telling us that he went to Arabia and he saw the bones, not fossils, but bones of these animals that were, were flying serpents, okay? Now listen to this. Later in another place, he says, Herodotus, in speaking of Egypt, he talks about the ibis, a bird held in high esteem in Egypt. The reason the ibis is so revered in Egypt is because of its habit of killing snakes, particularly nasty snakes, in fact. And it says, and not just regular snakes, 
but flying snakes. And he said, according to Herodotus, these snakes come flying into Egypt every year from the east. Well, now, if you remember your geography well, and you had a good geography teacher, if you go from Egypt and go to the east, where do you get to? Arabia. Remember, he just talked about what he found, the bones in Arabia. And now he's saying that it was from the Arabian Peninsula. But the ibises catch these flying uh, uh, serpents, snakes. They catch them as they fly through a rocky pass, and they slaughter the flying snakes there so that they do not invade Egypt. Now, this is in the writings of Herodotus. He talks about seeing the bones of the flying snakes in Arabia, and then he goes to Egypt and they tell him, well, the ibis is so famous here, we love that, because they fly and they kill these snakes before they can fly in from Arabia. So he sees the bones in Arabia, and then the people in Egypt tell him, we're thankful because those things come over here and they're poisonous. And he says, so Herodotus reports that these snakes only live in the Middle Eastern deserts, perching in trees in large numbers, and they happen to be very vicious and poisonous. Now, people say he lied, or he was imagining. Why would Herodotus write the truth about everything else, but when it comes to something that you don't want to hear, he's probably lying. Well, does that invalidate everything else Herodotus wrote? Well, no. It's just that you don't want to hear that. Well, it gets worse. And then there was Alexander the Great, okay? In 330 B.C., uh, after Alexander the Great invaded India, he brought back reports of seeing a great hissing dragon living in a crave, cave, which people were worshiping as gods. One of Alexander the Great's lieutenants stated that the Indian king Abyssaris kept serpents that were 120 to 200 feet long. Subsequent Greek rulers are said to have brought these dragons back alive from Ethiopia. This is in the writings of Alexander the Great. We know about him. He's considered one of the great leaders uh, in history. And, and he wrote about this, but it gets worse. When Alexander th uh, threw some of the parts of India into a commotion, and he took possession of others in India, he encountered, among many other animals, a serpent, which lived in a cavern and was regarded as sacred by the Indians who paid it great and superstitious reverence. Accordingly, Indians went to all lengths, employing Alexander to permit nobody to attack the serpent. And he went along with their wishes. Now, as the army passed by the cavern and caused a noise, the serpent was aware of it. Now, remember, this is Alexander the Great recounting this, you know, in his, in his journals later. It has, you know, the sharpest hearing and the keenest sight of all animals. And it hissed and snorted so violently that all of his soldiers were terrified and confounded. It was reported to measure 70 cubits in length. That's about 105 feet long. It was reported to be 105 feet long, and it was not visible in all of its length, for it only put its head out of the cave. At any rate, we saw its eyes, and his eyes are said to have been the size of a large, round Macedonian shield. Shield. You've seen the pictures of Alexander the Great with his men with those shields. And Alexander the Great says this, this dragon was in, in this, this cave, only stuck its head out. It appeared to be about 105 feet long, but the eyes were the size of a, of a shield. So keep in mind that, again, ancient history tells us of humans and dinosaurs being at the same spot. <coughs> Aristotle. <coughs> Aristotle was a Greek philosopher and a scientist born in Stagoras, northern Greece in 384 BC. So we're talking about BC again. He wrote the following. The eagle and the dragon are enemies, for the eagle feeds on serpents. And at another spot he wrote, the glanis in shallow water is often destroyed by the dragon serpent. Now, here's Aristotle. If you talk to people about Plato and Aristotle, they're going to tell you that these, are, these guys are solid. I mean, they don't, they don't lie. 
I mean, Aristotle had no reason to be lying about things. And, and it says, it might perhaps be supposed that the crocodile is referred to here that he's talking about, but this is specially spoken of in another passage this way. He said this later on after he made that statement about the serpent, um, the water is often destroyed by the dragon serpent. And it says, but there are others which, though they live and feed in the water, do not take in water but air, and they produce their young out of the water. Many of these animals are furnished with feet as the otter and crocodile, and others are without feet as the water serpent. So Aristotle tells you these were not alligators. And I'm not talking about the alligator, because the alligator lives in the water and uh, it has feet, and these water serpents don't have feet. So, so Aristotle was describing the water serpent, which is a type of Leviathan again. And then there was Marco Polo. Wow. Marco. <laughs> you know, we, we know about Marco Polo. We've read about his writings. And, and Marco Polo is just solid. I mean, you know, he's right up there with the other. He, he wrote about his travels. And he, he visited all throughout Asia and Persia, China and Indonesia from 1271 to 1291 for 20 years. And that's in A.D. Okay. That's in A.D., not B.C. And he recorded his journey in a work titled The Travels of Marco Polo, and it was published in 1300 AD. Much of his book detailed the interesting customs of the different ethnic groups he encountered, as well as the varieties of animals and plants associated with them. In chapter 49 of Marco Polo's uh, uh, travels, he describes dragons found in a province named Carajan, which is relayed in a matter of fact manner without any embellishment or, or uh, uh, mythology. And he went on to explain the behavior of the creature and how the people of that area killed them. This is what he wrote in his journal. Leaving the city of Yachi and traveling 10 days in a westerly direction, see how exact he was with everything? And you reach the province of Carazan, which is also the name of the chief city. Here are seen huge serpents, 10 paces in length, about 30 feet long, and 10 spans around, about eight feet around, uh, of their body. At the forepart, near the head, they have two short legs, having three claws like those of a tiger, with eyes larger than a four-penny loaf. I tried to look up and see what a four-penny loaf was, and nothing tells me. But, but a, a, a loaf that they're referring to was a small piece of bread. So I, I got to figure that a four-penny loaf was like this, okay? That's, that's all you can figure out. And so, and it was very glaring. And then he said, the jaws are wide enough to swallow a man. Now remember, Marco Poe is telling you what he saw. He, he saw this. And he said, the teeth are large and sharp. And their whole appearance is so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal can approach them without terror. Others are met with a smaller size, being 8, 6, or 15 paces long, and the following method is used for taking them. This is how, this is how they dealt with these animals. In the daytime, by reason of great heat, they lurk in the caverns. But at night, they issue to seek their food and whatever beast they can meet with and lay hold of, whether it's a tiger or a wolf or anything else they can devour. So they come out hunting for tigers and lions and all. So after which they drag themselves towards some lake or spring of water or river in order to drink. By their motion in this way along the shore and their vast weight, they make a deep impression. You know, they drag along the ground. And it says... So those who hunt them observe the track by which they are most frequently accustomed to go, and they fix in the ground several pieces of wood with sharp iron spikes, which they cover with sand. When the animals make their way towards the places they usually haunt, they are wounded by these instruments, and they're killed. And then the crows fly around and see them to be dead, so they start screaming, and then the hunters come and advance on the spot and proceed to separate the skin from the flesh, taking care immediately to secure the gall, which is most highly esteemed in medicine. In cases of the bite of a mad dog, a penny weight of the gall dissolved in wine is administered. So Marco Polo even tells you one of the medical things that they use the, the serpent's gall from in order to cure. The flesh also of the animal is sold at a dear rate, being thought to have a higher flavor than any other kind of meat, 
and by all persons it is esteemed a delicacy. This is written in Marco Polo's writings. We trust him in everything else, but we ignore what he has said. He saw dinosaurs in his travels. He saw them. And not only that, but the Chinese people were using these for medical. Now, the, the next one is the Chinese history. You know, the Chinese history is long and continuous. We're going to talk about China's history in another lesson coming up in a couple of weeks. But what we know is the Chinese history, as far as their written history, goes back to about 2500, 2000 BC, somewhere in that range. And the dates are not exact on any of this. But the ancient Chinese books even tell of a family that kept dragons and they raised their babies. Now, this is in Chinese history. They're telling you this. It is said that those days, Chinese kings used dragons to pull their royal chariots on special occasions, a, a fact which Marco Polo himself attested to in his writings. Marco Polo saw this in his writings. And in 1611 BC, the emperor of China, in their, in their written records, appointed the first royal dragon feeder as part of his staff. Now, why would the Chinese emperor appoint a royal dragon feeder if there were no dragons, if they didn't exist? <laughs> they, they were there, and that was a very honored position. Now, as late as, as 1279 AD in the Song Dynasty, the saliva of the purple dragon was said to be used to inscribe the names of the most honored ministers in their, in their tablets on jade and gold and, and crystal. Marco Polo was in China at this time, and he reported seeing the purple dragons. Now, to have a ready supply, the purple dragons were raised in the palace compound. They raised purple dragons in the compound, okay? And it's recorded that the dragon's favorite food, you'll love this, was, the, was roasted sparrows, okay? And so when they needed the saliva to write the names in the journal... <laughs> They would take roasted sparrows and wave them under the nose of the purple dragons and they'd start drooling and they would collect the saliva and that's what they used to write the names in the journals with. Now these are things that Marco Polo saw and these are the things that are written in the Chinese journals. And, and they also used them for medicinal purposes as we mentioned before. As late as the 16th century, they, they wrote these. And so, uh, we see that uh, the ground spine was used to cure gallstones and paralysis of the, of the legs. And then it, it said later after a great flood that uh, China was divided into different sections and when they drained off the water that many snakes and dragons were driven, driven from there. I want to go quickly to Morvidius. Morvidius was a king of Britain in 341 to 336. And, and it, this is written by Geoffrey of Monmouth, who was a famous uh, 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 historian at that time, and he recorded it in the British history. And it, and it said that he was killed by a dragon or monster that appeared from the Irish Sea, and he began devouring the inhabitants of the western shores in an attempt to stop this. Morvidius went there and, and got into hand-to-hand -hand combat with him, and the monster lunged at Morvidius and consumed him. Jeffrey described the animal as a type of dragon called a balua, and he gulped down the body of Morvidus, and a big fish swallows a little one. So again, it's in, in the writings. And then, and then St. George. And uh, uh, for the sake of time, I, I'm not going to go into all the details, but you know about St. George. You know that wherever you see St. George, and as we've been all over the world, you see these statues, there are cathedrals all over the world. It's always showing St. George attacking and slaying the dragon. Well, the reason that they show that is because that's what he was famous for. He did sl slay the dragons. And then the Epic of Gilgamesh. There's a Sumerian story that dates back to around 3000 BC, and, um, and, and it tells the story of a hero named Gilgamesh, who, when he went into a remote forest to cut down cedar trees, encountered a huge, vicious dragon. And then Beowulf. Beowulf was a legendary uh, a, a dragon slayer, and uh, we're told at the age of 88, um, he lost his life fighting with a, with a dragon, and an epic poem was written about Beowulf. And then we come to Philastratus, 
Um, and, and Philostratus was a Greek scholar that lived in 170 AD to 245, and he wrote about um, the whole of India is girt with dragons of enormous size, for not only the marshes are full of them, but the mountains as well, and there's not a single ridge without one. Now the marsh kind are sluggish in their habits and are 30 cubits long, that's 100 feet long. So you see he was writing about the dragons that he saw in, in, in those areas. And then the last one I want to mention to you very quickly is Li Xiao. He was a Chinese medical scholar that lived in 420 AD. And he documented this. For using the dragon bones, first cook odorous plants, bathe the bones twice in hot water, and pound them to powder and put this bag in gauze. Take a couple of young swallows, and after taking out their intestines and stomach, put the bags in the swallows and hang them over a well. After one night, take the bags out of the swallows, rub the powder, and mix it into medicines for strengthening the kidneys. This medicine is divine. Now, this is in his medicine book that he wrote, where he talked about using the spine of a dragon. How could he talk about using that medicine if they didn't have the spine of a dragon in order to use? Now, are, are, there, any, um, are, are there any evidences of, of actual artifacts that we see, uh, visual evidences of, um, of dinosaurs and humans being together? Uh, you see this picture of, of this child playing in this giant dinosaur. Well, that, that's a, a fossilized dinosaur footprint. But uh, one of my favorites is in Glen Rose, Texas, in the Paluxy River. Uh, along the Paluxy River, uh, there is a footprint here. And I've been to this museum, and I've actually seen this footprint. But um, this is a human footprint. Uh, this is a picture of a, of a dinosaur footprint. And right in the very tip of it, you see a human footprint there also. Well, you know that in order to have those fossils, the dinosaur had to step into mud, and then the human had to step into the mud, and then a wall of mud came and, and, and covered it, and, and that's how the fossil was made. That's the only way that you can do that. So that human and that dinosaur had to be there at the same time in order for those footprints. You see along the banks of the Paluxy River, they found many human footprints and many dinosaur footprints in the same rocks there. And so you, you do see those things together. Now, in, in Peru, in Ica, Peru, they have found over 15,000 engraved stones and, and these are stones of everyday life. Uh, they have pictures of complex medical techniques and advanced technology that we're going to talk about in a few weeks. But mixed in with all of those things are dinosaurs. Well, why would they talk about the advanced medical things they did? Why would they talk about other aspects of life, burial and deaths and, and marriages and things like that, and, and then throw in a dinosaur that's a myth? It's because they saw them. They were there when they, when they were making those. They're accurate. And then uh, there's the Geelong Bunyip picture. It, it occurred in Australia in July of 1845. And it, it, it talks about the finding of unfossilized bones. And they found the part of a knee joint there of some gigantic animal. Now, this is not a fossil. This is a bone that's there. And when the bone was shown to the aborigines who lived in that area, and they had no, no opportunity to talk to each other, but they said, they said instantly, oh, that's a bunyip. It's a bunyip. Every one of them identified it's a bunyip. And they said, well, what about it? And they said, oh, it's a frightening monster. And they gave a detailed account that many of the people had been killed by these bunyips. And the creature was said to be amphibious. It laid eggs, and from the descriptions appeared to combine the characteristics of a bird and an alligator. Now this is in Southern Australia where they found these bones. There are no alligators in Southern, so they, in Southern Australia, only in the Northern part. So it could not have been an alligator that they were talking about. One of the Aborigines showed uh, the writer several deep wounds on his breast made by the claws of the bunyip. He said, yeah, I ran into one one day and he almost got me, but I got away, but he got my friends. This is in Australia with the Aborigines today. What about the Chinese zodiac signs? 
The Chinese zodiac sign was done thousands of years ago, around 2,000 uh, years ago. And on the Chinese zodiac, it has 12 animals in it. And all the animals were living. It had the, the monkey, the rat, the, the whatever. And, and, and then they, uh, uh, you know those things. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then the, one of them was the mythical animal, the dragon. Well, why would they choose all of these animals for their zodiac and one of them was fake? No, no. They chose the dragon because of the characteristics of the dragon, just like they chose the others. When Margaret and I were there, our, our friend Stephen that was hosting us, uh, they gave us a rubber stamp, and uh, my sign is the monkey. Margaret's was the rooster. And uh, they gave us these stamps, and it spells our name out, Edgar and Margaret in, uh, in Chinese there. But, uh, but the, the, zodiac, the zodiac signs included the dragon. And then there's the Thracian helmet. There is a, in, in Thrace, we know that the helmet was there. And when you see the helmet, look what's on the top of it. It's a dragon there. They, they knew about the dragons. They saw the dragons. They had the details of the dragon. They put it on there for protection. And then uh, the last two. One is in Carlisle Cathedral in England. On the Carlisle Cathedral, when you go there, you'll notice in the lower left-hand corner, there's a carpet in the floor there. And when you take up the carpet, there is the tomb of Bishop Bell that was put there in 1496. And on that tomb, there's bronze, and they have carved all of these animals around there. And uh, so they put all of these other plants and animals from 1496 that existed in that area. And look at the bottom. There's an etching of these two dinosaurs that are there that they saw in 1496. The details are so great that you know that they had to have seen the dinosaurs in England in 1496. The person who carved it had to have seen them in order to have carved them in the bronze. And then the last one. <clears throat> we had the distinct opportunity to go to Cambodia and go to Angkor Wat. That was one of my dreams in life, was to be able to go to Angkor Wat. It's a temple complex in Cambodia that's over 10 miles square, and it, it, is, a, it is one of the wonders of the world. And, but one of the th exciting things for me was to have the opportunity. One of the gates that goes into the temple complex is, is stone that's carved with all of these scenes from everyday life. And uh, included in with all of those scenes are, are different animals that exist around in that area. And one of the animals that's carved there is a stegosaurus. Now this was done in the 1200s. Why would they have put all of these other animals in great detail and then have a mythical animal? There are no fossils of stegosaurus that live in the Cambodia and Southeast Asia. You have to go all the way up into China where they found stegosaurus fossils. So this guy must have seen a stegosaurus in order to get the details that he drew into this temple. So I go back to the thing we quoted in the very beginning. Did humans live with the dinosaurs? No. Every book you read in the, in the science books today are going to tell you, no. Look at the evidence that we've talked about. Dinosaurs came off of the ark with Noah. And they continue to live all around the world. We've just looked at a small number of the records of people saying, I saw one. This is what I saw. I saw it. I, I saw it with my own eyes. And then when they describe it, it matches up exactly with nothing else around. But everything you see is going to say, oh, well, you know, that's an elephant he's describing, or that's a hippopotamus, or it's an alligator, or whatever. I'm telling you that all of these people recorded all of this data for us. God preserved it for you and me so that when we read it in 2020, we will know his word is true. God told us that he made the animals and he made the dinosaurs. At the same time, he made the humans. He told us the dinosaurs came off the ark. He told us that they lived. 
and we see evidence that they did. Do you know why the scientists want to ignore that? Because if they admit that the dinosaurs lived with humans, their whole theory of evolution is gone. And the fact that they removed God from our history, God the creator from our history, that's their goal. That's what they want to do. And when you look at these facts, you know that our God is right. Is, our, is God's word a science book? You betcha it is. You betcha. It's a science book. It's there. The scientific facts prove that the Bible is true. But you're never taught those facts in school. I was never taught. As a teacher, I was never taught those facts that I could teach people. The teachers we have in most schools today have never seen these facts. I'll tell you what, if I were a teacher in schools today and I looked at the evidence that we've talked about in the last four weeks and the evidence that's going to come in the weeks to come, I would have a really tough time standing up before my kids and saying dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago. I, I'd be ashamed of myself if I did that. God's word is true. God's word is unchanging. I say again, the whole purpose in what we're doing is so that you'll know that God's word is true. It's true when he said that when the judgment day comes and you and I are found guilty and the wages of sin is death, if you've never acknowledged that Jesus was God's son and he came to the earth and lived a perfect life and died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, if you've never acknowledged that, when the judgment day comes, it's going to be a sad day for you because death, eternal death, separation from God is your penalty. But if you have asked him to come into your heart and pay the penalty for your sins, on that judgment day, his father is going to say, Ed, come on in. You're white as snow. I'm so thankful that Jesus loved me enough to come and die and pay the penalty for my sins. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this. Thank you for all you do. Father, thank you for loving us when we're unlovely. I pray that you'd come in and, and continue to work in our hearts to help us to know that your word is true and we can depend on it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.